Good to be here tonight, church. Lovely to be here. And uh, tonight we're in our series number, message number uh, four on the series, What's That in Your Hand? This whole series, God, God calls people to various missions. And when God calls you to a mission or a ministry, he gives you the wherewithal to do that. But sometimes when we get called to something that's huge, we think, I don't have what it takes to do this thing. And, and God, uh, Moses was one of those. He got called by God at a burning bush, fairly specky, and God says, I want you to lead uh, my people Israel out of captivity in Egypt to the promised land. And Moses goes, yeah, I'm not sure that I'm up for it. And he goes, and even if I tell them I'm on a mission from God, they're probably not going to believe me. So how do I get past that? And God says, what do you got in your hand? You go, oh, I got this wooden staff. God says, throw it down, and it became a snake. He said, now pick it up. Moses kind of went back a bit, but he picked it up by the tail, and it turned back into a staff. Here's the thing about that. He didn't think he had anything. God says, what you got, if you'll throw it down and surrender it to me, what seems to you to be natural becomes supernatural. What seems to you to be ordinary, if you surrender it to me, it will become extraordinary. And Moses picked up that snake. It became a, a staff again with that staff. He was the one that held that staff up and split the Red Sea so the people could walk through. He was the one when they were thirsty, tapped the rock with the, with the staff and water flowed. He was the one when the Amalekites came out after the Israelites. As long as he held that staff up there, uh, the Israelites would win. Uh, so God made what was very ordinary into something that was extraordinary. God made something that was natural into something that was supernatural. If God is calling you to do something, whatever you think is pretty ordinary in your hand, he's going to make it into something extraordinary. God, God, God sent the prophet uh, uh, Elisha to, to a widow uh, in Israel and, and uh, she, she had no cash flow, uh, no money. She was going to sell her sons, things were that desperate. And so Elisha comes uh, on behalf of God and he said to her, not what do you have in your hand, he said, what do you have in your house? And I look out at this church and I think, what do we have in our house? Uh, some ordinary people perhaps, but God, with the touch of God, you'll become extraordinary. With the touch of God, uh, what is natural, people will become supernatural. And she said, 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 2, nothing at all, nothing at all here, except, except a small jar of olive oil. And with that small jar of olive oil, the oil kept flowing as long as there were empty jars to be filled, and we'll look at that message next Sunday night. So God asks you, God asks us, what, what's that in your hand, what's that in your house? And often the resource that we're needing to fulfill the mission, that we, we kind of we put it down and say, it's, 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 it's not much, and God says, if you surrender it to me, it'll be more than enough. Well, tonight uh, we're looking at the story of David, shepherd boy David, uh, the, the, the shepherd boy who was to become King David. And the challenge is spelled out in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And the challenge comes in the form of a man named Goliath who is called a champion of the Philistines. And the idea of a, a champion, you might think, is, uh, is something that's always positive, but not all champions are positive. You've watched the tennis, Right. Some of you gave up on watching the tennis, but many of you watched the tennis and some of the people that have won trophies, you would not call them champions. Some you would, some you wouldn't. And this champion, it's not always a positive concept. It, it probably means they've won something. Doesn't mean to say that they're extraordinarily good because they're not. Uh, 1 Samuel 17 verse 4, a champion named Goliath who was from Gath, uh, came out from the Philistine camp. And the subsequent verses will tell us how big he was, how fierce he was, how mean he was, how godless he was. And so all, although this biblical text calls him a champion, uh, actually in the Hebrew it comes out like that, ish habenim, ish habenim. And literally that means a man who fights between the battle lines. Two battle lines, the Philistines over here and the Israelites over here, and he's in between. He's in between making a great big noise in between the battle lines. I think about that. I, was a, I grew up on the farm, 
in southeast Queensland, the Burnett Valley. And uh, we, we, we had we're the local show come to town once a year. Mum and Dad would pack the kids up in a picnic and we'd go off to the local show. It's an agricultural show, uh, but every agricultural show in a small town of 5,000 people where, I, where we were adjacent to, we'd have a farm. Uh, it wasn't just about the agriculture and the cows and the, and the stuff that agriculture brought. For us kids, it was really about Sideshow Alley. And we'd head down Sideshow Alley and uh, one of the things in Sideshow Alley that used to scare the wits out of me was the Jimmy Sharman Boxing Troupe. I've got some pictures for you here, the Jimmy Sharman boxing trip. Hope I've got there. There we go. And uh, Jimmy Sharman, he would stand up with a loud hailer. You go back to that other one. I haven't finished the drum yet. There we go. We'd have someone banging on the drum, and Jimmy Sharman with his loud hailer would go, Got my boys here tonight, and they're ready to fight. Who will fight my boys? A round or two for about a pound or two for a round or two. Uh, you can go three rounds, I'll give you five pounds. Come and fight my boys. Who will fight my boys? Next slide, please. <laughs> the Jimmy Sharman troop. We used to have a guy come to this church, his name was James Sharman. He was nothing like Jimmy Sharman, I've got to tell you that. <laughs> Who will fight my boy? Let's go in to fight the boys in the, in, inside the tent. I got that far and I saw them. I saw them outside dancing around, putting the boxing gloves on, and they had muscles on their muscles, these fellows, and on, on their muscles, on their muscles, they had oil, they're all oiled up. And I took one look in there, and I saw the first guy that was going a round or two for a pound or two, one of Jimmy Sharman's boys, he thumped him and he went down. And I thought, I don't like this. I'm not going to spend my money on here or even try to make a round or two for a pound or two. I'm going to the Dodgem cars on the other side of Sideshow Alley. I'm never coming back here. And, 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 and Goliath is like the Sideshow Alley Jimmy Sharman boxing troop. Who will fight my boy? And the Philistines are around, who will fight my boy? Here's my boy here. Who will fight my boy? And, and, and the Israelites are a little bit like I was as a kid. They're going, I'm not fighting your boy. I'm going over the Dodgem cars, over the other side of the valley. That's where I'm going. And, and, and the Philistines pretty much believed that all the Israelites would do that. They wouldn't take the guy on a round or two for a pound or two. They'd go to the Dodgem cars. They'd go away. So I want you, and just in case you think, I take him on, you big muscular guy, I'll, I'll take him on. Look at his size. Size, uh, let's the next slide. Size, huge. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, verses 4 to 7. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. And you don't know how big that is. That much more on top of me will make two metres, right? He's three metres. So that much plus a metre. That's how tall he is. He makes you look like a shrimp, man. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And on that he had his bronze helmet, which made him taller again. And he wore a, a, a coat of scale, armour of bronze. Yes, he did. Uh, and... And on, and on his head, a coat of armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. This, this boy is wearing heavy, heavy armor, 5,000 shekels. His jacket weighs 57 kilo. He's a mean hombre right here. And on his legs, he wore bronze greaves. You don't even know what a greave is, but it's a mean thing. And a, bron a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear's shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point, his spear, uh, weighed 500 shekels, about seven kilos, just, just the spearhead. Uh, and, and, and in addition to that, a shield bearer was walking in front of him, crying out, who will fight my boy? 1 Samuel 17, 24. Whenever the Israelites saw this man, they said, we go into the Dodgem cars. We're not hanging about here. Size huge, nature mean, and against Israel, against God, and against God's people. 1 Samuel 17, 10. Goliath stood, hmm, Goliath stood, I'm going to tell you what i got here. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for the battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man, choose a man and have him come to me. A, a, a pound or two for a round or two. Uh, go three rounds and give you five pounds. Who'll fight my boy? 
And if he is able to fight and kill me, we will be your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become subjects and serve us. And then the Philistines said this, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Size huge. Uh, nature, ferocious, mean, against God, against Israel, against all of God's people. Who will fight my boy? Who will fight my boy? The challenge brought fear and dismay and terror. 1 Samuel 17, 11, on hearing the Philistines' words, uh, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and what? Terrified. They went off to the Dodgem cars. That's what they did. 1 Samuel 17, 24. Dodgem cars were good. I enjoyed myself over there. I'd never go back to the boxing tent. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Great fear. Who will fight my boy? That's what the Philistines are saying. Well, well, no one. And and so a round or two for a pound or two, go three rounds, I'll give you five pounds, wasn't enough. So Saul steps up, 1 Samuel 17, 25. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will give him his daughter in marriage. That'll do it, Saul, right there. Michal was her name and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Who will fight my boy? I'm going to give you something to do that. This is the prize if you win. The king's daughter, Michal, tax-free for the family for life. Who will fight my boy? And up steps shepherd boy David. (laughs) I'll fight you, boy. I'll fight you, boy. Yes, I will. For David... Although this temporary reward, if you need a cash flow, you're going to go for this. But for David, it was more than the temporary reward. He was actually motivated by a reward of a more lasting nature, the reward that is related to the honour of God and the honour of God's people. Lift up the name of God. Lift up the name of Jesus. Lift up the name of your church. Who will fight my boy? David said, I'll do that. 1 Samuel 17, 26, he said, I want to remove this disgrace from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? 1 Samuel 17, 37, <laughs> Saul goes, at last, I got someone. All my guys are over there with the Dodgem cars. Last, I got one guy. And he says, go and the Lord be with you. And you go, wow, that's good, Saul. I, I don't think it is. You know the rest of the story. And you know, know David is going to win, but he's, he's like, he hasn't graduated year 12 yet. You, you, you big guys that are now university bound, you know, you turn 17, turn 18 this year, you're way ahead of David, you know? He says, go and the Lord be with you. Why would, why would King Saul send an untried teenage lad out to do battle with a veteran soldier who's bigger than anyone you've ever seen before and meaner. Why would he do that? Actually, what Saul did, he looked at David and he asked himself the question, what's he have in his hands? And then he answered himself and he said to himself, he got nothing. He got nothing. Last year, Ben, you know, and I've got the results because someone did keep them, it wasn't you and me. Uh, All the young adults did our, uh, our shape class and they also did the disc profile. And now all the details which I couldn't find, and I rang Ben, and he said, I haven't got them either. Hopefully someone has. So I rang Caitlin, and she did, and she sent them to me, and they're all on file now. And I know all about you lot. I know what you've got in your hand in your head. You see, from the disc profile, and I think about that. I think lots and lots and lots about that, you know. I want to know what my people have got in their hands and in their head before they go into ministry and on mission. I don't think Saul looked at that at all. Saul looked at David and he said in his heart, he got nothing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give him something that I would use and you can't give someone something that you use if it's not them. You've got to use what God's given you. 1 Samuel 17, 38, 39. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him. This is a shepherd boy. He never worn this stuff. He's out there looking after sheep and killing animals that come and attack his sheep. Uh, put a, a coat of armour and a bronze helmet on his head and, and David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around. And you go, this is just, i got this stuff on and I'm trying to walk around. It's just not me. 
And, and so I'm not used to these. I can't go on these. He said to Saul, he took them off. He said, I'm not used to them. He took them off. He's not going with those at all. I'm not, just, just not doing it. Not doing That's not who I am. What did Saul miss? He got nothing. Well, I'll tell you what he missed. What, what we find out is that David had a staff. Remember Moses had one? And David had a shepherd's bag, and in the shepherd's bag was a pouch, and in that shepherd's bag was a sling. And what David did before he went out to meet Goliath with his staff, his shepherd's bag, his pouch with a sling in there, he went and picked up five pebbles, smooth pebbles. And then it says, 1 Samuel 17, 40, it says, uh, he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he what? He approached the Philistine, who we know whose name is Goliath. And so the question is to David, what's, what's that in your hand? Oh, not much. It's a stick that they call a staff and a sling and five pebbles. That's, that's what I got. So we did the, the shape class. By the way, those of you who don't know what shape is, it's an acronym for spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. And that shows you what the gifts are that God's given you, spiritual gifts. And the disc profile uh, is, is about your leadership and personality uh, development and who you are. So he says, I, I just got this. It's one thing to have a skill, a gift, a shape, knowing what your disc profile says about you. It's another thing to know how to use what's in your hand. Some people got some pretty fancy stuff, but they don't know how to use it. 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep, and when a lion or, or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. You can just see this, a lion, a bear, got the sheep in its mouth. Uh, I went after it and struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And, and when it turned on me, as it would, if you take its food away from it, the lion or the bear, uh, I, I grabbed my hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine, big as he is and mean as he is, will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Uh, and Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. The tools and the weapons that David had in his hands, he knew how to use them. And this time against Goliath, listen to me, he would take the tools, the gifts, uh, and the experience, he would take it to another level. And I think we preached a message here on the last Sunday in, in December, and it was about change, and about my change, because I'm in a transition right now. And, and I look at these guys here, and many of you graduated high school last year, and something different for you. Some of you need to go to another level. I think about Ben over here, he's interning, doing a theology degree. And uh, he, he'd be in the office tomorrow for a fair bit of the day before he heads off to high school to see the next generation that have moved in there to year 12 since you lot moved out, right? Going to do some ministry over there with Pastor Lee over at Valdiva Secondary College. Be aware that one of my grandsons is starting there tomorrow, all right? Be aware of that. Whatever God has given you in your hands to use, be willing it to take it to the next level. 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 47. David said to the Philistine, he's going to the next level right here. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. I love the Bible. Heads will roll. Heads will really roll. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. I would like to say the whole world will know that there's a God in Australia, there's a God and his Holy Spirit resides here in, with us and we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to say that to the whole world. All those gathered here will know 
that it is not by sword or spear, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Uh, all those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. The battle belongs to the Lord. And he will give all of you into our hands. I, I want the catch cry of all of us tonight as we leave here is, is the battle belongs to the Lord. Yeah, we're going to do that shortly. In the name of the Lord Almighty. So question as we come back. What do you have in your hands? What do you have? What skill, what gift, what resource? Dedicate to the Lord the ordinary, and he will make it extraordinary. Dedicate to the Lord the natural, and he will make it supernatural. Last scripture. Grab, grab your communion, would you? Would you grab your communion? 1 Samuel 17, 50, last scripture tonight. You know the, you know the story. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. What he did then, by the way, he grabbed Goliath's sword, his own sword, and chopped his head off of it. Just to finish off the story, just say a good, good night's sleep tonight. <laughs> I wonder what mission God is calling you to. I, I just wonder. Uh, I wonder what... When you get the call, I wonder what giants are going to stand in your way. Our, our, our mission statement here is showing people all they can become in Christ. I wonder what giants stand in the way of you becoming all that God has purposed and destined for you to become. I want to say tonight in Jesus' name, you can defeat every giant doesn't matter what the nature of the giant is. You have all that is necessary and the battle belongs to the Lord and his name is Jesus. Take the top layer off, people. Find the bread. Bread signifies the body of Christ, body of Jesus, nailed to a cross for us. He defeated death, he defeated sin, he defeated everything. And when you eat this bread, in fact, you are taking into yourself the very victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you eat the bread with me tonight? Peel back the second layer and take hold of the cup stand with me, would you, tonight? I want you to say something with me before we drink. Because this, this signifies the blood of Christ, uh, the blood of the very same Jesus who died on a cross for each one of us, who went to the grave but beat death, and he lives forevermore. And what we're going to say together is the battle belongs to the Lord. Would you say that with me? The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's drink in Jesus' name. And Father God, tonight we take hold of that victory statement. The battle belongs to the Lord. And Lord, as we move into 2020 and as we move into change, as we move into university, as we move into school, as we move into whatever it is that the Lord is calling us to, whatever the challenges and giants may be, we declare tonight that everyone might know that we believe that the battle belongs to the Lord. And Father, thank you so much that in Jesus' name, we are part of that victory and we claim it tonight in that wonderful name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Let's sing together, people. Let's sing together. Let's give him all of the praise and all of the glory tonight in Jesus' name.